Good afternoon, everyone from New York City, the world headquarters of Photoshelter.com. You're watching another episode of I Love Photography Live. This is Alan Murabayashi, and I'm here with my co-host, as always, Fernando Gomez. Hey, Fernando. Hello. You might be watching us on YouTube.com slash Photoshelter, or you might have downloaded the uh, podcast by going to iTunes and searching for I Love Photography. Whatever the case is, we're happy to have you here. Uh, Fernando and I were just talking about the uh, shooting in Virginia, which caught live on television. Uh, pretty, pretty crazy. I mean, it, it's kind of crazy that we haven't seen uh, levels of violence like that before, but still just kind of jarring and very shocking to see the way that that media can capture such horrible, horrible events. I'm not quite sure what to make of it at this point. Yeah, I'm not sure either. <laughs> well, we'll get back to you on that after we mm -hmm. digest it a little bit. Uh, there's a lot going on in terms of uh, disaster. One of the first things we're going to look at are photos of the California wildfires, which, because of the drought, uh, are usually bad, and they're even worse than normal. And so here we have Max Whitaker uh, taking photos it's part of the Prime Collective. And Max is actually trained as a firefighter, uh, if I'm recalling correctly, as he should, given sort of the dangerous uh, nature of the work that, that they're doing. I mean, we, we've seen, uh, you know, these fires jump across uh, highways and whatnot. The temperatures are extreme. The wind conditions are extreme. Um, and here he is taking some pretty badass photography of... Uh, of the wildfires and I just can't I can't imagine how hot and uncomfortable it is and and how you deal with all of the stuff going on with your gear the ash and the soot um, it really it's it's sort of like extreme style photography yeah and the photos themselves are really striking they're very apocalyptic and I think some towards the end just really feel like the world is coming to an end like right that like that one that you yeah. with the helicopter flying overhead and just the smoke all in the air. It's yeah, it's something that and I had never really seen captured like this quite like this before. So it was really interesting to see. It's kind of crazy to see how dark the sky can get and how dark the atmosphere can get with mm -hmm. all of the the ash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that photo right there that you paused on with the firefighter climbing through the ash. It reminded me of a photo that one of my coworkers sent to me today of the woman who got caught in the 9-11 yeah. hallway. Yeah. And she was it was also a photo where it's all yellow smoke and she's covered in, in this ash too and walking through it. And I think she she passed today, so it was kind of a oh my gosh. Sad day for that too. But um yeah, it reminded me of this photo. Yeah, the 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 forest when all the leaves and all the grass and all the foliage is gone does have very much like a Terminator-esque apocalyptic uh, look to the landscape for sure. Great stuff from Max there. Mm -hmm. Let's see if these are loading. Um, we are celebrating, believe it or not, the 10th anniversary of Katrina. Uh, it's hard to believe that that much time has transpired so far. And we're seeing a lot of people revisit the spots and I guess first before we even look at the photos I had kind of a existential question in my head that that maybe you'd like to chime in on Fernanda which is what what's the point of going back to a place you know years after an event why why even bother doing that as a photographer uh, to see how it has altered the the landscape and the environment and the people and what kind of effect it's had. That's how I would initially look at it. Um, because it's, it's, you can't forget about these stories and it's so easy to do that, you know, with the news cycle. Something tragic happens, we talk about it for a day yeah. or two and then it's never heard from again. And I think something like Katrina that was so, so horrific and it took the government especially so long to acknowledge it and then to go back to it, it's it's kind. Of, I think it's really important. I think it was an important part in our recent history, and 
it's important to remember it and to make sure things like that don't happen again and to better prepare for situations like this. The photographer here on the Washington Post uh, is Chris Usher, who took the photos uh, and did the reporting, and he did diptychs for the most part of uh, people that he had encountered back then, and 10 years later he went to go visit uh, them. And most of them are still alive, but a few have passed away. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to say, these portraits are really, really nice. Really, really great portraits. He's usually using what looks to be uh, medium and large format mm -hmm. um, for these images. He got this family together. Um, I guess because he wasn't under the constraints of a, a hurricane zone, uh, it's more feasible to use large format photography, which, as everyone knows, is a little bit slower. It's not like picking up your DSLR. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it has a really, really nice effect for these images. Yeah, it does. He's taken some really beautiful portraits before and now, too. Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting to see how time has changed and how it has affected them. And here is one of the people who had passed away uh, prior to him getting to the 10th anniversary. So he took a, a photo of a tombstone there. Um, really, really kind of poignant. Yeah, I'm curious to see why he chose to use this um, different process. And I think he used some kind of tilt, shi tilt shift lens mm -hmm. in some of these mm -hmm. photos. And I'd be curious to hear his interpretation of that or his choice. Um, yeah, yeah. And then over on the New Yorker, some photos as well. This is uh, Alex South, who uh, you know is a, a great photographer of Americana, and uh, has gone down there uh, with the New Yorker and taken some lovely photos as well. Yeah, I like that the New Yorker, every now and again, really takes their time with their photo stories. Um, I mean, they're ma mainly like a literary magazine, but when they do spend time with a photo essay they do a fantastic job and they chose alex soth to do it and it's it turned out you know really great and it's a different take on it it shows scenes that you might not normally see and i just like the contrasts and the ideas that he puts forth regarding katrina and 10 years later yeah it's interesting most of the most of the uh, reporting that i've read talks about uh you know, so much of this engineering that's going on, um, rebuilding the wetlands to, uh, to, to, to prevent the kind of catastrophic destruction again. But, uh, you know, being aware that New Orleans is at sea level or below sea level in some parts, um, and then looking at the racial component as well. Um, blacks were sort of disproportionately affected uh, by Katrina. And, you know, it's, it's a very black area um, and to see the, the contrast of these areas being revitalized and seeing white people in the, the, the pictures and, and whatnot, it's a real interesting contrast. Yeah, definitely. Great, great photography. In the New York Times, here is a little piece that they put together called Walking in War's Path. Uh, Tomas Munita is the photographer, and he went to Israel and Gaza um, to cover the aftermath one year later of last summer's war, which you probably, I mean, I wasn't even aware that there was a war, um, to give you a sense of how out of touch we are and how long, I think also how long this conflict has been going on. Um, but he went to places both on the Israeli side and the Palestinian side and put together instead of doing a set of stills and instead of doing a set of videos, he did a hyperlapse. Um, and a hyperlapse is basically a, a, a time lapse, but where the camera is actually moving through space. And I got to say, I wrote a little piece on our blog about it. I thought this was really, really, really effective in terms of showing um, the place in a way that a still couldn't do it. The walk, the walkthrough was so potent in being able to see the, the entire environment. Mm -hmm. And he put together eight of them. So you see, you know, for example, this area is heavily destroyed, but he also goes into a hospital and you see people who are doing their physical rehab, you know, a child who's been burnt severely and a guy whose leg was shattered and doing physical therapy. And it really, 
it really humanized the experience in a way that I haven't really seen typical war photography do. Because typical war photography is edited down to scenes of tragedy, which certainly tug at your heartstrings, but they kind of miss the ambiance, just the, the general banality of like walking around an area and just seeing destruction, but also seeing the normalcy that, you know, people are so adaptable to it. So I really, really like this presentation and I hope to see more of this style of uh, photography and presentation before. Um, very cinematic in some parts um, and just a very interesting take. How do yeah. you feel about this? Yeah, I, had, I hadn't really ever seen something done like this before, especially with this kind of subject matter. And I, th I thought it was wonderful. I thought it it gives you more of a look at the life besides what the photographer chooses to frame and push out to the newspapers, to the media. I mean, of course, he is choosing what to show us here, but it's it's a wider view. And it puts us right in the action, in the scene. I don't know. I thought it was really effective. But then you still have, to have these great stills that would in themselves tell really amazing stories, really complex stories. So I think it was really well well polished and well done project. I thought it was yeah, a great way to do that. I have so many questions about how they conceived of this and how he actually went about taking it because you know, typically in time lapse photography or even in typical hyperlapse photography, your camera is automatically taking a picture every, you know, every fixed mm -hmm. interval whether it's 1 second or a half a second or 1 minute. And in this case, you kind of get the sense that he was snapping maybe when he thought was appropriate, maybe every three steps, but then maybe when he, when he got to something that he thought was newsworthy, he stuck around and maybe chose a little bit differently how he's going to take photos. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how he did it particularly. When I, when I first got my first DSLR that could shoot 1080p video, um, I, did, I was playing around with it and I chose to do a short little project on street photography mm -hmm. where I went around filming on the street just as I would shooting but I started filming and whenever there, there would be a scene that I wanted to shoot I would just click the shutter so then that way it stops recording at that point and it takes the photo immediately afterwards so then when I edited it it would show this process of looking for the moment and then the click of the shutter and you have the still so I was wondering if you did something similar to this. Yeah, interesting. It's all very interesting. And this this particular one, now we're looking at the Israeli side uh, near a kindergarten where they have uh, bunkers. Um, and we're going to see the camera kind of approach uh, a child and a woman, and the camera goes right over her shoulder, like literally inches over her shoulder mm -hmm. in a very, very cinematic flyby. The whole effect reminded me of a video game, a first-person video game. Um, mm -hmm. and at other times reminded me of kind of single tracking shots that we've seen in, in movie and television. Um, but really, really, really neat. And congratulations to uh, Tomas and the whole team over there for a, for a fantastic multimedia piece. Tech Dirt is reporting about a photographer who lost a copyright infringement suit against a map maker who used his photo. But here's the, here's the clincher. The guy put the image up on Flickr and he put it as Creative Commons, anybody can use it, even for commercial purposes. And he was surprised to see that someone took, took him up on it. So here's the image. Not a great image by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> we are looking at a house next to a small stream uh, and a road. Um, kind of looks like an overcast day, maybe a little bit later in the afternoon or early in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, not a great photo. Um, and yet, it was used by the Kappa Map Group. The photographer is Art Drag Dragulis. Um, and it was used on the cover of a street atlas for Montgomery County, Maryland. There you go. So, I mean, he, I don't know. <laughs> he kind of had it coming. I mean, he kind of had it coming. Yeah, when you, when you upload your photos to these websites like Flickr, you can choose what kind of copyright settings you want to attribute to them. And I have, in, in past jobs and internships, I've ha I have had to search for photos on Flickr using the Creative Commons license sure, for commercial yeah. purposes. Because people don't want to pay. Because people don't want to pay. And if it's there, if that's what the setting that they chose, that's the setting that they chose, you know? And you can't 
and try to come back and sue them after the fact. I'm trying to understand the motivation for anyone to allow any commercial entity to use their artistic output for free. I just don't understand that. Uh, exposure, maybe, if it's you know accredited, or you even know, if it's not. I I would I would at least negotiate for a couple free atlases. You got to give me something. That's an option. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I had a I had a food shot on Instagram, and I was approached by uh, one of the the local affiliate television affiliates to to be able to use it, and I politely declined. I said I just I don't work for free. Sorry, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter that it appears on Instagram or not. I mean, it was nice that they asked. Yeah, I'm sure these news organizations are getting a little bit more savvy about lawsuits uh, when they use people's images, um, but not going to do it. Don't care about that exposure. <laughs> I don't. I don't shoot my food on Instagram for exposure. I shoot it kind of to remember stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, we we like to be hard on Brand Stanton, who's uh, the Humans of New York guy. But he just helped raise two million dollars. Um, he created another Indiegogo account. This is the second one in less than twelve months. The first one was for a school in Brooklyn, and that Indiegogo. Uh, effort raised something like $1.2 million. And then uh, he created a new Indiegogo account to try to end bonded labor, which is effectively slavery in Pakistan. And there's a woman there who's kind of known as the modern day Harriet Tubman. Uh, and here she is, uh, Sieda Fatima is the woman. And uh, Brandon, uh, publicized this on his blog, Humans of New York, and ended up raising, at this point, over $2 million. And it kind of makes me wonder, is this guy the most effective photo activist we've seen in the history of photography? I think he might very well be. I mean, we've seen uh, photographers get together. I know when the Sherpas, um, a whole uh, lot of Sherpas were killed on Everest, a lot of the Nat Geo guys got together and ended up raising a few hundred thousand dollars, which is no, you know, walk in the park. That was real money, and it really helped the families of the Sherpas. But here he is raising two million dollars, and it kind of changes my whole opinion of like, it probably ch it changes my opinion. It probably changes his opinion about what he's doing. He started just trying to document people in New York, and now he's literally helping to raise millions of dollars around the world for various social causes. That's incredible to me. Yeah, it's getting harder and harder not to like this guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I don't know. It's great that he's doing this. It's fantastic. Um, it, it might be what you said, you know, the, the biggest philanth philanthropic yeah. photographer to date. Um, and it's he seems to be causing real change. So that's amazing. That's congrats to him. and. This is great. This is great news. So it kind of goes back to this whole thing. You know, I, I keep lambasting him. I, you know, I wish he was a better photographer um, because there are so many great photographers out there covering social issues who don't get a fraction of the traffic that Humans of New York gets. But the flip side of the coin, which I've also argued is, Stan is a superior storyteller. Yeah. Stanton, you know, even with all of the editing and the stories and the way that he rephrases things and whatnot, for which he's received criticism uh, mm -hmm. from from me and many other smarter people, um, he's still killing it in a way that no other photographer that I can think of today kind of continually on a daily basis gets the interest of a general population of people who don't really necessarily care about photography per se, but they care about good storytelling. Yeah, and I think that's that's where the money is, or that's you're on point in saying that his photos reach people who normally wouldn't be looking at photography, or wouldn't be looking at photojournalism or photo essays on an impoverished land or something like that. He just he puts it out in a way that it's easy to digest, and it's it goes along with the medium, the media that we're used to seeing today, and it it's working. He's using Indiegogo, like a super twenty first century platform, and you know, he's doing great, great things with it. Photography is almost secondary to the stories. The photography supports the storytelling, but it's not a, 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 an end in and of itself. Really, really just kind of interesting because I think a lot of professional photographers really think of themselves as photographer first. 
Mm-hmm. And maybe storyteller second, or maybe they don't really think storyteller. Maybe they just think, oh, I'm a photojournalist, or I'm a you know documentary photographer, or whatever. So just interesting to see the success that he has. You're absolutely right. It's harder and harder to criticize the guy. I think he's doing what he does, and he's doing it effectively. And you know, you go back to every analogy that we've had with Bruce Gilden and all these other guys. Mm-hmm. Everybody's doing kind of their own thing, and so you can criticize them at points during their career for you know one activity or another but the overall body of work is hard to sort of criticize yeah and I think the photographs or his work is less and less about the photos and the photography aspect of it and more about what they mean and what they represent exactly exactly we haven't talked about drones in a while why don't we talk about drones? We <laughs> talk about them every week. This week, well, I think the story came out maybe last week, and it turns out on NPR, drones, the sound of drones increases the heart rates of wild bears. Now, let's pause for a second. And we actually know that people who live in Afghanistan and Pakistan have really high levels of stress because of the drone noise. You can hear it, but you can't see it. And in the case of people, you know what the consequence is going to be when you hear that drone going overhead. There's probably going to be some sort of attack uh, on you or near you. Um, and so it's really not that surprising that the same sort of physiological effect is happening to wildlife like bears. And it kind of makes me think, for as, as much as I love drone photography, maybe we need a little bit of common sense or regulation around where and when we can fly these damn things. And I mean, I think in this instance in particular, the drones are being used to study the bears <laughs> that they are affecting. <laughs> Pretty ironic. <laughs> yeah, quite so. so. So maybe what we really need is kind of more silent drone technology. Maybe we should work on that. Yeah, we should get the government involved to use the ones that they're using to spy on us. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Just point it at the bears instead. <laughs> well, barring that, we have another piece for you because there is a Idaho company selling drone-specific ammunition called Drone Munition. <laughs> now, I've read a couple of stories. This is uh, shotgun shells designed to shoot down drones, and I've read several stories, and I, I can't really determine what the difference is between this shotgun shell and any other shotgun shell. I'm tempted to think this is merely just a branding exercise, which is fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure that it's necessarily legal to shoot a drone out of the sky, even if it's over your property. If, if it's high enough, it's probably illegal to do that. But I guess if the property owner has a gun and you just have a drone remote control, I don't know that you're necessarily going to confront the gun guy. I mean, this is probably targeted towards the bears. This is for the bears. Yeah, yeah. the bears need more ammunition, better ammunition. Yeah, that's a good point. Shoot the drones down, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I never thought about it that way. In uh, social media news, over on Gizmodo, they're reporting that North Dakota cops are using the Periscope app uh, to record traffic stops. Now, in case you don't know, Periscope is a app for iPhone and Android that allows you to live broadcast you know, similar to what we're doing, except now it's on your phone or mobile device. Uh, And they thought they would be on the cutting edge. So in Fargo, North Dakota, uh, the cops have mounted their phones on their dash, and then they stop, uh, have traffic stops, and they're filming them. Now, there's a ton of privacy issues with this, which they're they're sort of aware of. Uh, But in this particular example, they're saying, well, we got to a point where we weren't sure whether it was going to be dangerous or not, so we ended the live stream on Periscope. And so then you're kind of like, well, then what's the point? There, there's, a, there, there's obviously been no policy created other than let's turn these things on and see what happens. And I think that's a terrible, terrible thing um, for anyone, let alone law enforcement. Yeah, it seems like they didn't really think this all the way through. There's so many different factors that could, <laughs> out of they could halt the Periscope and would not be, you know, ideal for them and it had just was just bad publicity for them and just a bad idea from the get-go also i don't even understand periscope i mean you know i've been on there a couple times i can see a few instances there was a like a boxing match or an mma fight i can't remember which mm-hmm. where people were periscoping it so that you could steal the the broadcast 
And then there's a gal on there who has like 9 million followers, but all she does is go on and say, hey, how you doing? Hi, hi, as she's walking. So I'm <laughs> quite sure what the appeal is. Yeah, uh, I guess I'm the old guy now, Fernando. I mean, I've never been on it, so I, <laughs> you, you're better off on this than me. Um. <laughs> okay, cops, stop periscoping your traffic stops. It's not worth it. But I like how that story was in Fargo, in the same yeah. Fargo from Fargo. <laughs> yes, from the movie. Yes, absolutely. I've been to Fargo, in fact. It's not the most vibrant of towns. <laughs> uh, on feature shoots, a really, really cool... Uh, feature story on Mongolians, uh, and these are homeless Mongolians dealing with alcoholism and freezing temperatures. And uh, the Spanish photographer Mikel Aristregui Prieto uh, took a wonderful, wonderful series of photos in, again, the harshest of conditions. Apparently, there's a whole underground labyrinth of tunnels uh, in Ulaanbaatar, and this is where a lot of the homeless people live, but there are also steam pipes, and they get burned, and they're drunk, and they can't care for themselves, so the burns get infected, and then they drink to kind of warm themselves up and dull the pain of, of this terrible life. Um, a really kind of poignant and interesting essay kind of things that you never think about, these little, these little subcultures of people that you never even consider, um, and they're surviving. And here's, here's a picture of a woman peering through a manhole in the street. And it's hard to believe that, you know, it's effectively mole people living underground. Yeah, this was a, a great story and photographed so well. It reminded me of uh, I don't know if you know it, but Jessica Dimock's Ninth Floor yes. series. Yeah, it's kind of shot in a similar way, and it it shows all aspects of this of this community from from the underground to their reaction to other people's reaction to them to their life after to them trying to get treatment. And I think it was really interesting in the article. They mentioned how the locals who are not the people living underground treat these as barely human. And they just avoid all contact, and they want them out of there, and they're they're just completely outcasted. Yeah, as many homeless are. The mm -hmm. so you referred to Jessica Dimmick. Jessica Dimmick uh, photographed a heroin den here in New York City. Um, and to your point, just a lot of a lot of weird, crazy things going on, uh, and a very gritty style of photography for which she got a lot of accolades and awards. For but yeah, very reminiscent. All of these small little enclaves of, of forgotten people, that you would otherwise never really know about. Because I yeah. think the ninth floor was somewhere here near the Flatiron District. Yeah, right near our office, and this is literally underground where you're stepping. So these these images of people popping their heads out of the manholes, you just you just can't even believe it. I mean, it's just so shocking to me in some ways. Um, really, really great job by the photographer there. More fantastic photography out of Asia. This is on the Washington Post, and it is about eagle hunters in Mongolia. The photographer is Tariq Zaidi. And first of all, the photos are amazing and the clarity on them. I don't know what sort of sharpening and saturation he's doing, but they look kind of hyper real, um, but super fantastic photos. Yeah, they're just really, really cool. I don't know whether he's using a, a, a filter, a polarizing filter to get the sky to, to pop like that as well, but mm -hmm. it just, it's so striking, the photography. You know, I saw this online and I was like, wow. Yeah, and it, it's an interesting bond between the, between the eagle and the, it, it is an eagle, right? Or a falcon. Yeah, an eagle, I think it is. Yeah, and their, and their owners where they, they grow up, they have to be the same. They can only work or hunt for one person all of their lives. They have to be trained by one person, and they live for, like, I think 40 years, so they become part of that person's family. It's amazing. And I don't even know what's going on in this one. Here we have two guys, and there's an eagle sort of landing on one guy's arm, and then is that a fox or some sort of dog? I don't even know what's that's, going on here. That's the, so I was trying to think about this, and I think because in the later photo you can see another fox. I think that's the fox that the eagle hunted. Amazing. Amazing. It's just crazy. 
Well, in some of these, it looks like in, in this particular photo, it looks like he's using a strobe. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'd love to see kind of the behind the scenes of of what his gear was. And, you know, he had to be out there for a while to get these images, but really, really great job by uh, Tariq. <sighs> Some good photography this week. Mm -hmm. Here's another one I love. I thought this would appeal to you because of the street photography aspect. There is a swimming pool in Prague, and uh, they hired a street photographer named uh, Rishab Kaul, who's hired. Uh, to go there for two months and document the Podoli public swimming pool. Uh, and the, the, the goal wasn't to just shoot the pool, but the life around the pool. And he found how vibrant a community was actually at the pool, not only amongst the swimmers, but the people who are just kind of hanging out there. And again, another great set of, of photographs. And I love the black and white. Yeah, I really, really like these as well. Um, it's funny that you should think of me, but yeah, they <laughs> They're great. He captures all aspects of the of the culture and the pool, and I think this was for a kind of a historical project about the pool, and I and he does he does just that. He captures different generations using it. I think there's one photo of a young man about to enter the pool, and then older there it is, and, yeah. and an older man looking at him enviously or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the old guy's still in good shape. He is. Yeah, he is. <laughs> But yeah, I love the, these geometric lines and the mm -hmm. shadows and kind of makes me want to go to a pool and, and shoot. I mean, I'd like to get paid to spend two months at a swimming pool and <laughs> yeah, shoot. Really. I'd love that. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic stuff. This is over on Pixel. All of the links that we're talking about today, you can find on our blog at blog.photoshelter.com. We hope you check it out. We're getting near the end, so we're getting a little more featurey. Here was a, a picture on BuzzFeed Rewind. It's kind of the throwback channel of, of BuzzFeed. Mm -hmm. And they had 31 pictures showing you Woodstock, the original Woodstock Festival, which is kind of the granddaddy of music festivals. Um, and this is in 1969, and 400,000 young people showed up. I think it was 10 times more than they expected. Uh, and these photos are crazy. The amount of traffic, people doing drugs, <laughs> people passed out. Uh, there's a mix of color photography and black and white photography, and you kind of see how dirty and nasty, but also how like nice and peaceful everything was. Yeah, I had I didn't really know that it was this big, but this was a movement. Yeah, I think they they were expecting fifty thousand people, and they got eight times that crazy here's Jimi Hendrix uh, in color playing the guitar um, yeah just really really amazing amazing and the owner of the farm was sort of like hey man this is cool whatever yeah <laughs> <laughs> but I mean and here's an aerial shot this is where you needed the drone apparently you didn't need the drone because they got a plane or something look at all those people holy bananas that's that's amazing <laughs> And, you know, again, the eight times more people, 10 times more people showed up than they anticipated. There are no facilities or very yeah. few facilities. It's like, how did anyone survive? Amazing. I saw that they were getting medical supplies helicoptered in, which is just crazy for a music festival. Insanity, insanity. Fantastic stuff. And here are the owners of the farm um, with all of the trash and stuff in the background. And they look pretty damn happy. Yeah. <laughs> And this image, by the way, this image uh, is taken by Bill Epridge. Bill shot the uh, the RFK uh, assassination photo, um, and he's oh, wow. one of the the prime uh, life guys. So, fantastic work. We have come to the end, and we have one more funny story for you. And this is a wedding photography, which always lends itself to great moments. You know, I, I spoke to a wedding photographer once and I said, do you ever get kind of bored of shooting photography at weddings? And he goes, no, because it, it's sort of like a microcosm of life. There's a couple falling in love and there's always a few couples falling out of love and there's everything <laughs> in between. And I was like, holy crap, that's so smart. Mm -hmm. So smart. Uh, in this case, the wedding photographer is Sean Cook and he was shooting a wedding in Chicago when all of a sudden the bridesmaid fainted as the couple was kissing. And so here you have this wonderful <laughs> photo. I mean, without the bridesmaid, it's still a wonderful photo. It's afternoon light coming in. There's a faint shadow of uh, the window panes. Um, but there's a woman on the floor completely passed out. <laughs> um, and it's just sort of amazing. 
Yeah, it's nice to see another one of these wedding photos after seeing the one where the photographer fainted. Yeah, he tripped. He tripped. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> these are ah, these are great. These yeah, are great. fun. Um, uh, so they said it was an especially hot day, and I guess she just got a little bit of heat stroke and uh, passed out, as so happens sometimes. You know, here's the thing: if you're in a in a situation where you're feeling woozy. You know, I I don't know that you have to grin and bear it like that, even though it's your sister's wedding or whatnot. Just have a seat, have a drink of water. <laughs> Not a big deal. Better than you know, passing out and hitting your head and going into a coma. I mean, she made internet fame out of it, so <laughs> she did. And so did Sean. It's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, there we go. Another full week of photography. Um, I know we're going to have a lot to talk about uh, next week. Uh, with this this shooting and all the other stuff that's going on. We haven't even talked about Donald Trump that much, but there's a great photo that I have in mind to show next week and talk about in terms of political photography. Oh, photography is everywhere. I love photography. <laughs> so do I. <laughs> so for, for Fernando, this is Alan Robayashi. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.